What? What is going on? What? Look at this. Look, yes, there's condoms on my wall, but more importantly than that, they're deflated condoms. How big are atoms and molecules, really? You're told that they're all sorts of different sizes, and this is used to justify a whole range of things, but how could you really test that they really are different sizes? All you need is a layer uh, that molecules can pass through, and we're gonna use latex balloons. So we're gonna do this with some helium balloons and several other balloons as well, um, filled with different gases. So one of these is going to take about 10 liters to fill. So if I want to make about 10 liters of carbon dioxide, I can use the classic baking soda and vinegar or acetic acid and sodium bicarbonate reaction. Now, it took me a while to nail down the recipe for 10 liters of carbon dioxide gas, and if you're really interested, you can visit the You Can Science It blog where I give the step-by-step -step process to figure it all out. Regardless, this recipe works out to be about three cups of white vinegar vinegar at 5% acidity and 2 tablespoons of baking soda. The yield for this recipe is between 10 and 11 liters. So I found this big old uh, water bottle to use so I can already put the balloon on it. Um, but this is a lot of vinegar and baking soda. I wrapped it up in these paper towels and poked holes in it. That's to slow down the reaction a little bit because I don't want it to suddenly overflow. But just in case that happens, I have this splash pan here. So the idea is I'm going to drop this in and quickly screw on the top. Let this fill up to as much as it needs to fill up to. But why am I filling up all of these balloons? Well, the idea is to use Graham's Law of Effusion, which looks like this. Basically, it says the time it takes for one gas to spread out or squiggle through a surface with lots of tiny holes in it, divided by the time it takes for a second gas to do the same thing, is equal to the square root of the molar mass or mass per molecule of the second gas divided by the square root of the mass per molecule of the first gas. So in this case, I have different gases passing through the latex of the balloon, which has lots of tiny holes between the latex molecules, and the goal is to compare the relative times it takes for the gases to escape their rubbery imprisonment. Pull that off, do a little tie off, and now I only have to do this three more times. Now I'm going to do some with just plain old air, which is mostly nitrogen with a little bit of oxygen added. Yeah. The whole point of this was actually just to get a whole bunch of balloons filled with gas. And they're just going to sit for a few days and gradually let those gases seep out. And the hypothesis I have right now is that the helium, because it's a smaller atom, it's a single atom, it's doesn't form molecules, is going to seep out much faster than the nitrogen, which is going to also seep out faster than the carbon dioxide. But to be more quantitative about that hypothesis, I'm going to go back to Graham's law. Let's say helium is our first gas and nitrogen is the second. So we put the mass per molecule or molar mass of the nitrogen on top. Each atom has an atomic weight of 14 and there are two atoms in a molecule giving us 28. And we put helium on the bottom. Each atom has an atomic weight of 4 and they just float around by themselves. So we put 4. This gives us a ratio of about 2.6, that is, the amount of time it takes helium to move through a barrier, it should take nitrogen gas 2.6 times longer than that to do the same thing. Now, if we look at carbon dioxide and compare this also against helium, I need to plug in its molecular mass on the top. This time, the molecule has two oxygens, each at 16, and one carbon with an atomic weight of 12 gives us 16 plus 16 plus 12, which equals 44 grams per mole of gas. Plugging this into Graham's law, the carbon dioxide should escape 3.3 times slower than the helium. What I'm going to do is every day, I'm going to come down and once a day I'm going to go ahead and measure the circumference of them. And that should give me a rough estimate of the volume change as a function of time over several days. So it's only been like four or five hours since I put these up and completely contrary to what I thought, the carbon dioxide balloons have totally emptied out. The helium balloons have emptied out a little bit, but the nitrogen balloons are basically the same. The carbon dioxide should escape 3.3 times slower than the helium. So, uh, this video is going to be different. It's been like 
five days, and I'm pretty sure that this experiment has failed because there was way more that went into how gases pass through a membrane. Case in point, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide was the largest molecule we had, and yet it shrunk the fastest. Apparently, carbon dioxide um, dissolves into latex. Like, if you had liquid latex, you'd be able to dissolve a lot of carbon dioxide into it. And that property continues even when the latex is solid. Sort of the carbon dioxide almost worms its way in, and so it deflates much faster than the rest of them. I mean, this one deflated within eight hours. Now, the helium balloon has been behaving pretty much exactly as expected. It's gradually deflated. It's kind of stabilized at this size. And then this one, is our nitrogen balloon, and it's still the same size. It's been five days, it hasn't changed size at all, so I'm gonna go ahead and take a different tack. Condoms. I know what you're thinking. Normally, condoms are latex, which would have just the same problem that we did with the carbon dioxide going through the latex balloon. But fortunately, due to people having latex allergies, I mean, I guess it's not fortunate that people have latex allergies, but fortunately, there are non-latex condoms. Some of these are uh, probably polyethylene or polypropylene, which I'm a little bit concerned that the carbon dioxide will have the same activity. It might dissolve into it the same way that it dissolved into the latex. So I also got these natural lamb condoms. So these condoms are made from the intestine of a sheep, but that means that there aren't latex at all. Also, these condoms have the problem that they don't protect against sexually transmitted diseases. However, for my purposes here, that's going to be great because that means that viruses can fit through the, the porosity of um, this material. And if viruses can fit through, certainly carbon dioxide and any other gases that I put in are gonna fit through fine. The other thing that I'm gonna try is instead of doing nitrogen, I'm going to use this uh, air duster canister. Now this is just filled with difluoral ethene. I drilled a hole in a, in a little bottle cap and then hot glued it onto the end there so I can have something to kind of grab onto it around. But I'm gonna use this gas instead of the nitrogen so I can make sure that there's a large difference between the number of molecules on one side of the membrane and that it's effectively zero on the outside of the membrane. So all three of the gases that I'm going to be using, which is this difluoroethane, carbon dioxide like before made the same way, and I went ahead and uh, bought a little helium tank here. I'm gonna start out with these uh, lambskin ones. I'm gonna use the helium first because it's a little bit easier to control and I really don't know how big these will inflate. Never open opened one of these ones before. This, this is a little mini experiment too. Ooh, it's very gooey. Oh, much wetter than a regular condom. It's like sausage. Oh, these ones are even harder to figure out how to unroll. There we go. Oh, there's a little string at the bottom. You still have a little, little stretchy. It's like, uh, it's like a sock with a little, uh, elastic thingy at the one end. Ah. Put that over there. Can give it a little twist. Whoa. Nope, nope. I don't have a good enough seal at the bottom. Ah, there. Okay. Hold this. Ooh. Aha! Oh-ho! Oh-ho! Look at that! Soup! Twist it off. It, it's very much like a sausage. Let's mark it. Helium. There it goes. Oh, it's so wet inside. Okay, three, two, one, go! Whoa! Oh man, it slipped right off. That's much easier. C2H4F2. Two down, one to go. Let's open number three of the really wet natural condoms. Just like I did with the other one, just kind of hold it. Like earlier, I don't want the reaction to go too fast so that I have time to kind of figure this out. Ooh! I think I'll twist it. We have carbon dioxide, C2H4F2, and helium. In the meantime, I want to go ahead and do some of these ones. That. All right, now that you look like you're ready for a bachelorette party, we're going to hang these up and see how long it takes them to empty out. So I just got home from work today, and, and, and what? What is going on? What? Look at this. Look, yes, there's condoms on my wall, but more importantly than that, they're deflated condoms. The difluoral ethane here, kind of squished down. The uh, carbon dioxide, totally flat. And the, and the helium, helium, pretty much fine. Pretty much the same size, it went down a little bit. 
but not very much. You know, I thought maybe on, on these ones that the carbon dioxide would react the same way um, with the polymer, um, but nope, nope. We've got carbon dioxide kind of squishy, difluorethane kind of squishy, and the helium, it's, it's still pretty full. It's about as full as it was before. So I don't know what's going on. I, I, I really, I don't know what is going on. I have to do more research. So I've been doing a lot of reading, gas sorption and diffusion and permeation in polydimethylsoxane or some such. It's not latex because latex is a bunch of um, different kinds of uh, polymers all sort of mishmashed together. So scientific papers don't like to use sort of generic things like latex. But after reading through this, I got a much, much better idea of how the carbon dioxide was going through the balloons and why I keep getting bizarro results. And that's simply because it's way more to it than Graham's law of diffusion. Um, it actually is probably better modeled by Fick's law of diffusion, which is a combination of Graham's law and Henry's law of absorption. So here's my model of a uh, latex surface here. So each one of these rubber bands that I've stretched across here is like one of the little polymer chains. We have tiny molecules like this. This, this would be representing something like a uh, helium atom. Either the helium ends up dropping straight through or it kind of bounces off the top layer, but it tends to either jump, bounce off entirely, or if it hits just right, it'll fall through. Now, I assumed that carbon dioxide was just a little bit bigger than the helium, well, maybe a lot bigger, but bigger than the helium, and it would follow the same properties. But actually, the carbon dioxide has many more interactions with the latex surface, and some of them are entropy-driven, sort of hidden down um, underneath Henry's law is um, there's actually more ways for the gas molecules to be absorbed into the surface than there are for them to be out of the surface. It's kind of like it's got little hooks on it. Now this is not literally true. It's more of a metaphorical way of approaching the idea, but it's as though the carbon dioxide um, and the, uh, you know, the difluoroethane has sort of more hooks on it. So they have a tendency to stick into the latex surface and then get pushed through by their neighbors that are coming in after them. And so this will actually get totally filled up and deform. You might remember from before where uh, the balloon would kind of have this funny texture and that's when actually the latex would have got completely filled up with the carbon dioxide molecules and it was actually um, plasticizing or making rigid the uh, polymer matrix that, that made up the, the latex. You'll see with this sort of a thing, even when I drop it, it kind of just sticks. Um, it doesn't exactly fall through as much because what happens is it just kind of sticks in there and gets stuck. But then because when it reaches the other side, the uh, gradient of partial pressure, that means the amount of carbon dioxide in the air to the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the latex, is so huge that it just falls out the other side. When we talk about permeability, there's three different processes going on. Adsorption, diffusion through the material, and then desorption where it flies off the other side. The main driving factor for these uh, latex balloons and the carbon dioxide is adsorption and the diffusion through the polymer. Now, if you get a big enough molecule, it's still going to behave, you know, even if this was a spiky one, I didn't make one, but even if this was a spiky one, it's still going to have a hard time fitting through those holes and it's going to take a long time to get through. Also, you can get really long chains of molecules, like say this is some sort of you know, uh, hydrocarbon, um, and it goes on here, it'll kind of absorb in really easily because it's got all these spaces that it can get onto it through, but it, it's such a huge molecule that it takes forever to get it to pull through. Once you get to a large enough um, factor, Graham's uh, diffusion again becomes important. And um, the way the mathematics actually works out, within Fick's law, you have this diffusion constant. Um, this other stuff over here is is like pressure and uh, pressure difference and some other things. Um, 
but the but the main thing especially for like a balloon where the pressure difference is really negligible we kind of just ignore that so what's on the top is the solubility characteristic from henry's law and on the bottom of that diffusion is graham's law of diffusion number so that's the the square square root of the of the molar mass so what ends up happening is if you get a large enough molecule like like this or one of these honking things then it goes back to being primarily driven by graham's law but in kind of this in between range where you have the carbon dioxide and the, and the difluoroethane that I was playing around with, you end up where the solubility term um, on the top has a much more important role than the minor differences in the molar mass on the bottom. I'm going to try some other experiments here. Got some uh, butane fuel because we're going to try that. And because I got tired of doing those uh, carbon dioxide uh, reactions, um, I got some CO2 chargers for bicycles. Also, I've decided that I'm going to try to react some uh, hydrogen peroxide to see if I can get a couple of um, oxygen balloons. Okay, so I figured out my new setup here. I'm going to I'm going to catalyze some hydrogen peroxide, um, but instead of using like magnesium uh, oxide, we're going to actually use yeast, which has an enzyme in it um, that will help release the oxygen that's in the hydrogen peroxide. And I'm going to do that one first because um, under my new hypothesis, the oxygen is going to actually be the one that leaves the slowest. I was able to kind of rig up my butane canister with a little a little straw there. See, it says danger right here, extremely explosive. Contents under, don't mess around with the uh, opening. I still have uh, plenty of this dust stuff left, the dichloroethane. I'm also going to use, these, like I said, these canisters. Oh gosh. And I'm also going to do one again still with, with my lungs because even though the big balloon didn't behave, didn't do anything, I think it's going to work a lot better this time because I'm using water balloons. I don't know why I didn't start using water balloons in the first place. Now again, we're using the latex, but I now expect the carbon dioxide to actually um, get out the fastest. So I'm going to fill it up last. Similarly, I was reading this paper here, it showed that the Butane had a very high solubility um, and also had diffused through uh, this um, polymer barrier. So I'm going to assume that also it's going to diffuse through the balloon very, very fast. Then this was kind of in between. It's a little bit like, you know, it's a little bit like butane. It's also got a couple of fluorine atoms on there. And fluorine is like heavy. That's what the floral and difloral ethane means is fluorine atoms. I still think that it's got a relatively high solubility, but it's, but it's just a heavier molecule. We're going to do helium next, and after that we will do air from my lungs and then oxygen. So in reverse order is the order I'm going to fill them in. So I don't want to be like trying to fill things up and then having the size change and trying to measure it. It's driving me crazy. We're going to start um, with the fun reaction where we're, where we're catalyzing. Now it's a catalyzed reaction, which means that what's going on is is something that's going to happen naturally. I'm just speeding it up. And so I built myself a little reaction chamber, just a straw with a whole bunch of hot glue. So yeah, let's get started. Oh, safety. So, um, you know, fill it up to about, yeah. Here's the yeast, just like you use for bread or beer making. Okay. Put the balloon on, and it should, oh, oh, go. I'm just gonna be patient, cause it's now, no, no. Oh, I'm glad I'm wearing the glasses. This is a much gooier experiment than I thought balloons and gases would, you know, be. There. Oh, ooh. So, um, sometimes the manufacture of these balloons is a little bit sketchy. I'm not going to use this one. Were there? They were there. Yeah, I'm doing three of them in case, you know, I get a, a shabby balloon or a shabby knot you know I could do five or fifty if I was being really serious but you know it's for fun yeah that's good enough Ow. right what was I doing next air regular air oh god it's gonna pop oh god and two uh, helium still got this guy it doesn't float Three gases down. Three to go. Difluoral ethane. Difluoral ethane, done. Yeah. Ooh. 
Whoa. Yeah. Not gonna work. Whoa, gosh. I want to be able to measure these, but I think the best way is actually gonna be to use the camera. It's been about 10 hours since the experiment started, um, and it's not working exactly as I expected. The oxygen is emptying out slightly faster than the nitrogen, even though the nitrogen has a larger molar mass, but it's a really small amount. Considering all the weirdness that I was having with these gases up here, I'm guessing that oxygen has some sort of solubility, has a, has a larger solubility than, than the nitrogen. I need to look that up on a table to verify, but this is the results that I got, but I'm much more pleased with how it went. The difluoroethane emptied out a little bit faster than the butane, um, but again, that's that's okay. Carbon dioxide, as expected, went through the facets because it has a high solubility and a low molar mass. Helium came down pretty quick because it has a low molar mass. So yeah, but it's interesting to note that while these gases up here follow much closer Graham's law, the oxygen's a little bit questionable. There's so much more going on when you're dealing with something like the latex barrier than just Graham's law can encapsulate. Fick's law is a much better way to approach something that is that is as complex as the strangeness of, of rubber barriers. There's entire theories devoted to trying to come up with good models for diffusion through rubber barriers and by and large even the very best of the best models don't predict everything all the time. So much of chemistry is still an empirical science because it's really hard to know exactly what's going on with each of the molecules. You can't go in there and look at it. If you want to test Graham's law you can probably get away with helium and nitrogen. Ideally you should get an ideal noble gas like argon because I think then your results will follow Graham's law much more closely but with something like a latex barrier and all of these other gases it's really not going to work very well. Now I've gone in and detailed like I usually do. I had to research a lot to even get this much understanding. It is a hugely complex subject. But if you want to learn more, there's a link to my blog where I talk about the process that led to this final experiment. Um, I give all the data that came from this experiment. Um, but you don't have to just read that. I mean, you can try it yourself because you can science it. Pew! Pew! Oh, oxygen is so fun.